Hello, it's Scott Manley here. On Thursday, Korea made the first launch of its KSLV-2 orbital class rocket. This is the first entirely domestically developed rocket to come out of Korea. And let's be clear, this is South Korea, the Republic of Korea, not North Korea. So uh, Korea has launched stuff to orbit before using a rocket that they developed with Russia, but this is entirely domestically developed. Now, the launch wasn't 100% successful, and we'll talk about that in a bit, but the R, it was at least successful enough that they were quite happy with the result. So this launch vehicle is a three-stage vehicle. It's about 205 tons that's supposedly able to put one and a half tons into a 700 kilometer sun synchronous orbit. The vehicle is about 50 meters high, and the first stage is about 150 tons, and it's propelled by KRE-75 engines. That's Korea rocket engine. So these engines burn kerosene and liquid oxygen. They use a, they're an open cycle gas generator pumped fed engine. Um, that burns for like a couple of minutes, and then the second stage uh, kicks in. That also uses the KRE-75. The only big difference here is that the nozzle is extended so that it gets more performance in the you know, less, the lower pressure air. Also, because it's got a single engine, they need to have roll control. Uh, for that, they use the gas generator exhaust and they dump that through little nozzles that give them a little uh, roll control there. So that stage is about 40 tons or thereabouts. The final stage, is about 12 and it has a much smaller engine. They have the KRE-7, which has only seven tons of thrust and a big vacuum optimized nozzle. It's still a pump fed engine. Um, and so yeah, that supposedly can put that mass into, into orbit. That final stage burns for about 500 seconds or thereabouts. Unfortunately, in this launch, the first stage went well, the second stage went well, the third stage, stopped its engine about 45 seconds too early and we're not really clear why but based on the performance of the engine the mass of the satellite um, and the time that it stopped early we can guess that it came about one kilometer per second short of the seven and a half kilometers that they needed to get into orbit so they went up they deployed the payload. Unfortunately, they were on a suborbital trajectory and they re-entered the atmosphere probably uh, you know, in the Indian Ocean at the same latitude as uh, Australia. So why did it stop early? Well, you know, we honestly, we're not getting much information. There was a live stream, but the live stream just gave us camera feeds and some talking heads. It never gave us any telemetry. And the experts on the stream didn't really seem to know what was going on, to be honest, either. Um, but you know, I could speculate that maybe it failed because there was a problem inside the engine that just stopped the, caused the engine to prematurely shut down. There might have been a problem with the propellant being fed to it. They might have lost pressure in the tanks. Uh, it's possible that the engine was not perfectly balanced and was burning one propellant more than the other. And so they ended up running out of propellant early and shutting down. I presume that they have some idea and they are looking at this and trying to solve the problem. But they seem happy with the result they got. The fact that they got you know that close to orbit is a good sign and hopefully when they launch their next attempt or make their next launch attempt in May of next year that uh, they will be successful. So yeah Korea has had an active space program for, for decades now. They have the Korea Aerospace Research Institute and they've been building satellites and flying sounding rockets. They have a space center in uh, the south of the very south of the Korean Peninsula on an island. It's the Naro Space Center. Although technically it's not an island, I guess, because it's connected via road bridge. It's about 300 miles south of Seoul. Um, so yeah, they've had satellites. The first satellite that was Korean of Korean origin was Kitsat, Korea Institute of Technology satellite. That flew in 1992 and that was on an Ariane 4. But they've also had several satellites called CompSat, Korea multi-purpose satellite and they seem to have really shopped around for their launch providers. The first one flew in 1999 and that was on a Taurus launched out of Vandenberg in California. CompSat 2 was in 2006 and that was on a Rockot, a Russian rocket uh, that flew uh, out of Plisetsk. CompSat 3 was an H2A which is a Japanese launch. 
Um, there's had a couple of launches in the Dnieper, uh, Russian launch vehicle, and there's also GeoCompSat. There's been a few of those, and those have flown on Ariane 5. They're also planning to launch a lunar orbiter next year. That'll fly on a Falcon 9. And actually, there was also a Korean uh, astronaut. So they did this whole selection process. It was very public. There was a lot of TV coverage of how they were selecting the astronauts. And it ended up they selected one man and one woman. And, you know, like in the last month before launch, the man was pulled from the flight because of some you know, misconduct and replaced by the woman. She flew to the International Space Station for eight days and did some experiments there. Um, she returned on a Soyuz with Peggy Whitson, and I can't remember the cosmonaut's name, but unfortunately there was a bit of a problem with that Soyuz guidance system on descent, and they, instead of a, you know, controlled re-entry, they did a ballistic re-entry and experienced really high Gs. But, you know, Peggy Whitson, of course, continued her NASA career after that. It wasn't, um, it wasn't the end of that, but, you know, Korea hasn't launched any astronauts since then. Now, I've said that this is the first domestically built Orbital class rocket, but they've previously built rockets. Um, so the KSR series, Korea sounding rocket, um, the first generations of those were solid rocket motors, you know, standard sounding rockets. But KSR-3 is really interesting as a stepping stone to the development of KSLV-2 because it was a liquid, liquid fueled um, sounding rocket burning kerosene and liquid oxygen. They had a pressure-fed engine on that, which, um, you know, certainly not the same design as what they're flying now, but no doubt it gave them a lot of experience with working with a semi-cryogenic uh, propellant. This engine generated about 12 and a half tons of thrust and the whole vehicle was about six tons. And that was able to do some great experiments. But around the same time in 2002, they proposed turning this into an orbital launch vehicle. What they would do is they would take the core, they would add a small solid motor as a second stage or third stage, and then there would be two other ones. So you'd have three of these sounding rockets strapped together. The exterior ones would light, and then when those burned out, the core would light, and then finally the third stage would be used to put the hardware into orbit. But that never went anywhere because in 2005, they started working with Russia. And this is where the domestic side comes in. So they instead decided that the KSLV would be a collaboration with Russia. And the core of this is basically uh, the core of the Angara, right? Universal rocket module, or I think is what they have. Uh, so Russia ended up building these. The second, the engine on this stage was the RD-151, which if you look, is probably derived from the RD-150, which was flown in 1974. It's a predecessor to the RD-170 and therefore 180 and 190, which of course propel the Atlas V and Antares. So, the RD-151 is about a 205 tons thrust rocket motor. It has, it's a closed cycle engine, so it's more efficient than the engines that Korea has built themselves. Um, but unfortunately, Korea couldn't get the technology for this. Now they thought in during this collaboration, when they started it, they thought that they would be able to get some of the technology and use it and adapt it. But not Russia didn't really want to sell them the science, they wanted to sell them hardware. The US actually didn't want another com country to get the technology to build ballistic missiles. So they were quite happy to, you know, ask Russia to not give them anything but hardware. So yeah, out of this deal, Korea never actually got the ability to build the rockets. So they had these uh, KSLV-1 was what it was called originally. It was renamed to the NARO rocket. The Korean contribution was the upper stage, which was a like a two-ton solid rocket motor. They also contributed a fairing. And this design would, in theory, be able to put uh, a 100 kilogram satellite into low Earth orbit. The first launch from the NARO spaceport was 2009, and that worked really well. Both stages actually performed exactly as they were supposed to. Unfortunately, 
the fairing never separated. So that second stage was pushing extra mass and was therefore unable to reach orbital speed and ended up you know, falling back and burning up. The second launch in 2010, it flew for about a minute or so and then there was a flash and the stage just disintegrated. And there's a bit of, it's a bit of a contentious issue as to who was responsible for this particular failure. Korea obviously would love to point the finger at Russia. After all, it was their stage that exploded. Russia, however, counters that the stage probably exploded because of a premature activation of pyrotechnics to separate the second stage. Now, not really clear what exactly happened, but at this time, it, it doesn't matter because the countries have gone their separate ways. Not before they finally did succeed with Naro 3 in 2013, that did actually launch and it did actually put Korea's first domestically launched satellite into orbit. But even before the deal with Russia was over, Korea was starting to work on their own rocket engines, their own first stage engines that could carry rockets uh, to space. Um, now, their early engines on the uh, sounding rockets were pressure fed. They needed to upgrade these to add turbo pumps so they could kind of get the fuel pressures that they actually needed and make their rocket light enough. Um, eventually, by 2018, they were ready to perform a test flight. And what they did was their very first test flight was basically the second stage of the KSLV, right? So it had a single engine on it, it had the roll control, and it had a dummy stage on top of it. They never expected this to go to orbit, but it did demonstrate that their KRE-75 rocket engines performed as expected, and therefore set the scene for this week's launch. So look, Thursday's launch is a big step forward for this relatively small country. And I say small country, you know, these days Korea's GDP is comparable to that of Russia. It's quite amazing to see how that country has grown in terms of its economic power. Um, now, they are, if this works, they do plan to offer this as a launch vehicle to other uh, provider, you know, to other customers. I believe it may cost about $30 million to put a satellite into orbit. And that makes it sort of competitive if you ignore SpaceX. But then again, if you're launching a one and a half ton satellite, you're probably not going to be a dedicated launch. Um, so it may not work for you. They're also planning on upgrading the vehicle to be geostationary, you know, the KSLV GEO, I hear, which will use more powerful KRE 90 engines, presumably 90 tons. And the second state, our third stage engine will be a their first stage combustion engine, which is, of course, like another rocket technology that they have to try and master. So, you know, good work, Korea, getting this far. Let's hope you get further on your next attempt. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.